Chronic back pain is back pain that lasts at least three months. It is one of the most common reasons for people to visit the doctor and to call out of work. It is also one of the most costly conditions to our healthcare system. It's important to understand that back pain is a symptom which can have multiple different causes. Now, some causes of back pain are serious, but they're relatively rare and they can be identified pretty easily. The five most common serious causes of back pain include cancer, like if you have a tumor in your back, a fracture in the back, infection in one of the bones of the spine called a vertebral infection, inflammatory back disease, and something called cauda equina syndrome, which deals with the nerves that go through the lower back. There are certain warning signs or red flags for a serious cause to back pain. These include back pain that is accompanied by a fever, unexplained weight loss, changes in urinary or bowel habits, back pain that is accompanied by changes in sensation to the groin area, what we call saddle anesthesia because the sensation is changed in the area where you would sit on a saddle, and new pain that comes on in somebody who's 75 years of age or older. These causes make up no more than about 15% of cases of back pain. The other 85% of back pain is called nonspecific or idiopathic musculoskeletal back pain. So what causes nonspecific musculoskeletal back pain? Here is where there is some confusion or controversy. Oftentimes, doctors will get an x-ray or an MRI of the spine and they will find what we call a minor abnormality and say that's causing the back pain. These minor abnormalities include degenerative discs, what's called degenerative disc disease or DJD, also called osteoarthritis or arthritis, or bulging discs. And usually these are found at one spinal level. You may have heard people say they have a bulging disc at the L4, L5 spinal level, for instance. The problem is that research studies going all the way back to the 1990s show that these minor abnormalities are not associated with back pain. That's right. People without back pain often have things like degenerating discs or bulging discs. Unlike back pain, which occurs most often in middle-aged people, these minor abnormalities occur more often the older you get. For instance, 93% of 70-year-olds without back pain will have at least one degenerative disc and 77% of pain-free 70-year-olds will have at least one bulging disc. It's relatively easy to determine whether a bulging disc or degenerating disc is in any way involved in back pain. If I have a patient who comes in with an L4, L5 disc bulge, then the pain should really be restricted to a narrow segment of the low back. But if we do an examination and there's pain over a large area of the back, then it's unlikely that the L4, L5 problem could be causing all of this back pain over multiple spinal areas. So what does cause most cases of back pain? it may surprise you to learn that so much scientific research over the past decade or so indicates that it is the brain, and particularly brain regions that are involved in both pain and emotion. 
I will explain. First, some basics about pain. If I pinch my finger until it hurts, a nerve signal travels all the way up to my brain, and my brain decides how much my finger will hurt and sends a signal all the way back down to my finger. Then my finger hurts. This happens very fast, automatically, and outside my awareness. But science shows that pain is always an experience created by the brain. There have been scientific reports of people who have had brain disorders, like a big stroke, and they can't feel pain anymore. So really, it is no brain, no pain. Second, it is important to understand that there is no distinction from what we may call physical pain and emotional pain in the brain. Some scientists did a study where they recruited people who had just been dumped, they had just had a relationship ended, and they put them in an MRI scanner and had them do two things. First, they had them look at a photograph of the person who had just dumped them to elicit emotional pain. Second, they used heat to induce physical pain. In the brain, there was no distinction between the physical pain and the emotional pain. It was the exact same regions, and these regions were involved not just in pain sensation, but also in emotion. Now returning to back pain in the brain. A research team from Northwestern University wanted to look at chronic back pain in the brain. They had chronic back pain patients continuously rate their pain level while in an MRI scanner looking at brain activity. And it was activity in emotional brain regions that distinguished between periods of high and low back pain. That's right, even though patients were reporting their physical experience of back pain, it was emotional brain regions that indicated that they had high pain. The same researchers followed up this study with another study that is truly amazing and every human should know about. They took people who had just suffered a back injury, they did an MRI of their brain, and then they followed them for one year. At the end of the year, some people's back pain had resolved, while other people's back pain persisted becoming chronic back pain. The best predictor of who would have chronic back pain was differences in connections in emotional brain regions on the MRI scan that they had had. This was a better predictor than any pain characteristics or any treatments they had had in the intervening year. So what does this mean? It really means that 85% of back pain is a real physical manifestation of emotional pain. It means that back pain patients are carrying around the emotional pain of their lives in their back. We know that things like trauma, stress, and emotional pain take a physical toll on the body. We know there is a high degree of overlap between depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder and back pain. Similar to these conditions, back pain is a manifestation of emotionally painful life experiences. Now, some people will ask, are you saying that my pain is in my head, or that it's my fault, or are you calling me crazy? Absolutely not. Your pain is real, it is in your back, it is not your fault, and you are not crazy. Remember my example of pinching my finger. 
even though the pain is in my finger, the experience of pain is created by my brain. In back pain, the pain is in the back, but it is created by nerve signals that are sent down from the brain, and particularly those brain regions dealing with pain and emotion. It's not your fault. Like the pain in my finger, the brain is causing back pain automatically outside your awareness, so you don't even know when it's happening or how. But there are two recently developed psychotherapy approaches that help you become aware of those signals from the brain that are causing your pain and to stop them, to change your brain to reduce or eliminate your pain. So let's talk about those two. The first approach is called Pain Reprocessing Therapy, or PRT. In PRT, the therapist first helps you identify how the brain is involved in your specific pain, and then helps you retrain your brain through a procedure called somatic tracking. In somatic tracking, you either imagine or are asked to perform an activity that increases your pain a little bit, accompanied by activities that help your brain be less bothered by the pain, including mindfulness activities or cognitive activities. My friend Yoni Ashar and colleagues published a major research study in 2022 that showed that two-thirds of patients who completed PRT had little or no pain at the end of the program, that is, a 0 or 1 on a 0 to 10 pain scale. They also did MRIs of the patient's brains and found that there were brain changes that were associated with reductions in chronic back pain. The other psychotherapy approach is called Emotional Awareness and Expression Therapy, or EAET. EAET helps you process emotions related to trauma and relationship stress that you have been carrying in your back. The goal, once again, is to change those brain regions involved in both pain and emotion. My colleagues and I published a study in 2020 of older patients, primarily with chronic back pain. The average age of patients in this study was 73 years old, and they had many minor abnormalities on MRI scans of their back. Many of the patients had had prior surgeries, procedures, medications, injections, but at the end of our study, there were 20% of patients who had at least 70% pain reduction, a huge number for an older, complicated group of patients. So once again, a substantial number of patients had their pain pretty much completely eliminated by EAET. Now, if you are not ready for either of these psychotherapy approaches or you have trouble finding a therapist, there are actually many self-help books that walk you through these and similar techniques, and I will put some of my favorites in the video description. So you're probably asking, why don't more people know about this? Why do doctors keep saying that it's a degenerative or a bulging disc that's causing back pain when that just isn't so? Well, I feel like when people go to see their doctors, the doctors want to help. They want to make a diagnosis and come up with a treatment plan, and they're using the best information that they have. Many of the research studies I've discussed are relatively new and other studies indicate that it takes on average 10 years for new information to enter clinical practice. 
it is a radical departure to think of the brain as the organ of back pain. It's hard for people to understand this, including patients and medical providers. But that's why I'm doing this video, to get the word out and to let people know that there is hope for treating back pain. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel so we can grow this community of people trying to understand the mind-body connection. Thank you.